Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, a, a few years back, my good old Uncle Oli decided that he would like to try his hand at raising some chickens on their farm. So he went down to the feed and hatchery store and he told the guy in there what he wanted to do. And the guy said, do you want to just buy some chickens or do you want to start with eggs? And Oli said, I think I would like to start with eggs and raise them. So the guy said, I'll tell you what, I'll sell you 25 eggs. Our eggs have an 80% success rate. And so you could, should get about 20 chickens from them or 20, uh, somewhere in that range. And Oli said, that sounds good. So he took his eggs and went home. But about a week later, he was back. He said none of the eggs had hatched. And the guy at the store was shocked. He said, that's never happened to us before. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you another 25 free of charge. And Oli said, that sounds good. So he took his eggs and left. But about a week later, he was back again. Once again, none of his eggs had hatched. And the guy at the store was even more surprised this time. He said, I don't know what's wrong with those eggs. Can you think of any reason why they might not be hatching? And Oli said, well, all I can figure out is that I'm either planting them too deep or too close together. <laughs> <laughs> Oli did not know much about raising chickens, I don't think. Instead of doing what he needed to do, which was to incubate them so they could hatch and grow, he buried them, smothered them. Now let me turn from chickens to churches. How can individual churches in this world, in this nation, be so different? How can some churches be vibrant and alive and active and others be stagnant and dormant? Because we know that some are. And I'm not talking about the size of a church here. Uh, just because a church is large doesn't mean it's bubbling over with life. There have been large churches that were kind of spiritually dead and small churches that were just on fire. <laughs> and so what is the one thing that makes a difference between a, 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 an alive church and, and, and a kind of smothered, dormant church? Well, the, the one thing that really makes a difference in determining whether a church is living or dying is the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit. A church that is alive is a church that is filled with the Holy Spirit. A church that buries its gift from God and smothers the activity of the Spirit is one that is destined to die, just as surely as an egg planted in the ground. So how do we make sure that our church, First Lutheran Church here in Princeton, Illinois, is a church that is stoking the fires of the Holy Spirit rather than throwing water on the flames? The title of my sermon this morning is The Spirit-Filled Church. Now, before I go any further, I want to make one thing clear. There is no magical formula for making the Holy Spirit work in our midst. The Bible is very clear that we do not control the activity of the Spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 8, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. He is describing the Holy Spirit there. The Holy Spirit is God the third person of the Holy Trinity. And, and we have about as much chance of controlling the action and direction of the Holy Spirit as we have the chance of changing the, the jet stream with a little house fan. <laughs> but we can look at the characteristics of those groups in churches where the Spirit of God has moved in mighty ways. And we can seek to create an atmosphere here in our church which is compatible with the purposes of the Spirit. And there's no better place to look for those characteristics than in the very first group of Christians on that day that the Christian church was born, the day of Pentecost, called the birthday of the Christian church. There are so many things that could be said about the day described in Acts chapter 2. But there are three things in particular I would like to lift out this morning. These are three marks of the Spirit-filled church. So number one, number one. The Spirit-filled church is an obedient church. The Spirit-filled church is an obedient church. In the opening verses of Act 2, we read, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now what made all of that possible? It's right there in the first line. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. 
Why were they all together in one place? They were there because Jesus told them to be there. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was talking to the disciples on the top of the Mount of Olives, moments before he ascended into heaven, in verse 4 we read there, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. And what was the promise of the Father? Jesus said, you heard it from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, what do you think would have happened if the disciples had just left the Mount of Olives after the ascension and scattered to a dozen in a dozen different directions with a dozen different agendas in defiance of the clear command of Jesus? I'll tell you what would not have happened. They would not have been gathered together in one place to experience this incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And people, the same is true for us today. The Spirit-filled church is an obedient church. And an obedient church is a church that goes where Jesus wants it to go. Does what Jesus wants it to do. And that begins in the lives of the individual members of the church. All of us. God calls us to lives of obedience. Yes, the church is a place that is filled with sinners. I know that. But it is also a place where, where sinners come to be healed. It is a place where sinners are called to repent. It is a place where sinners come to change their lives. You know, one of the most deceptive and wrong-headed ideas that is sometimes taught in Christian churches is the idea that when a Christian is struggling with a particularly difficult temptation or sinful desire, he or she should just take it to the Lord in prayer and then sit back and wait for the Holy Spirit to descend and do something. But the Bible teaches no such thing. The Bible says that we are going to struggle with temptation our entire lives. It's called spiritual warfare. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we, going to, are we going to give in or are we going to obey? John MacArthur in his book, The Vanishing Conscience, says that if you are struggling with a particular sin, there is no point waiting for some heavenly power to erase the sin automatically from your life. You must stop it and stop it immediately. <laughs> When a church is filled with people who are committed to obeying God's word, committed to resisting the temptations that are all around us every day, then, then the stage is set for a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The fact that the followers of Jesus were all together in one place indicates to me that they were committed to obeying the command of Jesus Christ and their willingness to obey is what put them in the right place at the right time to receive this incredible outpouring of the Spirit. The Spirit-filled church is an obedient church. And then a second characteristic of a Spirit-filled church is that the Spirit-filled church is an evangelistic church. A Spirit-filled church is an evangelistic church. When the Holy Spirit came upon the followers of Jesus on the day of Pentecost, he came for a very specific purpose. But before I talk about that purpose, I, I need to clarify something. You need to know that as believing Christians, we already have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. As soon as you believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. Again, referring to John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot be enter into the kingdom of God. So if you are born again, if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the forgiveness of sins, you have the promise of eternal life in heaven, you have the Holy Spirit in your life working in your heart, trying to mold you, trying to shape you into the person God has always planned for you to be. But this coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was something different. This was wind, this was fire, this was people speaking in tongues. This is not the kind of activity that the Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit that you and I are going to experience every day in our lives. We're not going to have fire sitting on top of our heads. So what was God doing here in this particular in instance? What, what plan did he have for the Christian church that, 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 that caused him to come in such a dramatic way? Well, the answer is that, that he was calling them to this exciting new evangelistic mission. The Greek word evangelism comes, or the word evangelism comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good news. Euangelion, good news. Evangelism is about spreading the good news of salvation through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
That is exactly what Jesus is talking about in the moments before he ascends into heaven. After telling the disciples to wait in Jerusalem, he said in verse 8 of chapter 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The dramatic outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was given to the church in order to empower it so that it could carry out its mission to share the gospel with the world. And I believe that God chose the day of Pentecost to launch the mission because of of the symbolism of that Jewish holiday. Pentecost was a Jewish harvest festival established by God way back in Exodus chapter 23. And so God on the day of Pentecost uses this harvest festival to drive home the point about what his church is supposed to be doing. We are to be God's instrument to bring about a harvest of souls in the world. And the disciples of Jesus understood this because as soon as the Holy Spirit fell on them, they went out into the streets and they began to preach the gospel. And the timing was perfect. We read in Acts 2, 5 that they, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Why were there Jewish people from all around the world in Jerusalem at that moment? Because they were in town for the festival. <laughs> every year, thousands and thousands of Jews scattered around the world came to worship at the temple in Jerusalem during the Jewish holidays. The most important of those holidays was the Passover. But those who traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover usually stayed around for seven more weeks in order to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost as well. So on this day, when God launched the Christian church through this powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the disciples went out into the streets to preach the gospel to the world. They didn't have to go far. God brought the world to their front door. And Judy read that great list of them. They were all right in the neighborhood. And people, the same is true for the Christian church in our day. It is important for us here at First Lutheran Church to support mission work in far-flung places around the globe. And we do that. But, but it is just as important for us to see the mission field that is right outside our door in our neighborhood. We are to be witnesses to our friends and our neighbors, both in the words that we speak and in the lives that we live. That's why it's so important that we we treat everyone with love and honor and respect. Because we don't know if that person is the one who, if if we treat them right on a particular day, might say, I know that person is a Christian, and because of the way they've treated me, I want to know more about that. Now you can understand why, why, why the first point, obedience, is so important. When you profess to be a Christian, people look closely at your life to see if you really practice what you preach, if you're truly living the gospel. And that may make make the difference about whether they come to faith in Christ or not. I was so disappointed. uh, uh, Just a couple of years back, there was a a politician that I admired. I won't mention mention his name, but he was a professing church-going Christian, you know, outspoken Christian uh, man, family man, wife and children, fought for all the right things, and then he gets caught in an affair with a woman who was one of his staffers. And his disobedience to God did not only cost him his job, it did not only cost him his family, it also undermined his faith and values message that he tried to proclaim in his public life. It gave people another occasion to ridicule the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people, the world is eager to attack the church if we give an opportunity. You know, look at they say when they, when they see the disciples preaching out in the street. They say in verse 13, they are filled with new wine. That's people attacking the church on day one. <laughs> but Peter was able to say in verse 14 with a clear conscience, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. Come up, smell their breath. <laughs> they, were, they, they were not out there in a compromised way. And, and, and he was able to say that, and then he said he went on to proclaim the gospel to the people who were assembled there. And by the end of the day, 3,000 new Christians were baptized. The obedience of the church sets the stage for the outpouring of the Spirit, which God gave to us. 
both here in our neighborhood and around the globe. The Spirit-filled church is an evangelistic church. And then the third point I want to make, the third mark of a Spirit-filled church, that is that the Spirit-filled church is a focused church. There's an old nursery rhyme that, that goes like this. You may have heard it. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to visit the Queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you there? I chased a small mouse that ran under her chair. <laughs> now the joke behind that old nursery rhyme is that here this cat had the incredible privilege of being in the presence of the Queen, and yet his attention was focused on a stupid little mouse. If we are to be a spirit-filled church, we cannot get sidetracked by trivial matters. We have to know what things are most important, and we have to spend the bulk of our time and our energy on those things. As one of my pastor friends used to say, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> when Peter stood up to preach the gospel to that crowd on the day of Pentecost, he began by quoting these words from the Old Testament prophet Joel. He said this, he said, and in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. On my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. This is a vision of a church that is focused on the big picture. These are men and women, old folks, young folks, people from every station in life who do not want to just waste their lives on the trivial pursuits of this world. They want to be a part of something big. They want to be a part of something important that God is doing. They want to make a difference. You know, one of the things that I enjoy about, uh, you know, I, I like to go on, on the social networking site, Facebook, because it allows me to stay connected with family members and friends, and I've been in in a few different churches so I can stay connected to what's going on in people's lives, uh, people that I've known. Um, and a lot of trivial, unimportant stuff gets shared on Facebook. I'm aware of, aware of that. That's part of the fun of it. But, but I was just thinking recently, just a few months ago, there was a young girl who was one of my Facebook friends. She was one of my confirmation students in a former church. She's now in her 20s. And it seemed like over a stretch of time, just about every day or every other day, she was posting something like, going out drinking tonight with so-and-so, or going partying tonight with my bestie, or whatever. And I don't want to come across as being judgmental or insulting, because, um, but, but I have this urge to sometimes comment on her post. I've never done it, but to comment, but, but what important thing are you doing with your life today? What important things are you doing with the life that God has given you? What vision do you have for how God will use you in the years to come? You know, you're in your 20s. You're, you're, you've got a lot of life ahead of you. What is God going to do with you? Think about that. I worry about her. I worry about others like her who are caught up in this culture of frittering away the incredible potential that God has given to us by chasing mice under chairs instead of realizing we are in the presence of the king of all creation. God has a special place in his grand plan for each and every one of us. And, and, and he has a vision and a purpose for us every day that we are alive, right up to our last day on this earth. And we can have a lot of fun in this world. There is time for fun in this world. But we have to remember what is really important. We need to keep our hearts and our minds focused on things that are important to God. The Spirit-filled church is a focused church. There are so many lessons we can learn from this very important passage of Scripture from the second chapter of Acts, so I can preach on it every year because I can find something new every year. But these three things spoke to me this year as I thought about the future of First Lutheran Church, that the Spirit-filled church is an obedient church, the Spirit-filled church is an evangelistic church, and the Spirit-filled church is a focused church. And I pray that these things will be important to us as we move into the next chapter of our, of our ministry here at First Lutheran. And may we always remember the thing that is of highest importance to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is all summed up in the last words of our text, Acts chapter 2, verse 21, where the Apostle Peter stands before that Pentecost crowd and says this. He says, and it shall come to pass 
that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what we want to see, more of that. Amen and amen. Please rise.